Thank you, Danielle, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to uh, all those that are uh, watching live today. Uh, this is um, an eight uh, lecture series uh, that we're going to cover in uh, three weeks, uh, two sessions a week uh, for a total of six sessions. The uh, agenda will come up here in a minute. Uh, Danielle already gave you an uh, introduction to, of myself, so uh, we can just skip the rest of uh, this slide. Uh, just as a way to know who is uh, speaking to you a little bit in terms of the experience, uh, this is a map. It shows the basins that I have done analysis in for uh, six months or greater. So it uh, covers quite a bit of the world. Uh, the course objective will take a quick look at what we do in the early exploration phases. Uh, by that, I mean from acquiring acreage uh, to uh, figuring out uh, which uh, uh, blocks we want to bid on and then where in a block that we uh, have the uh, license to uh, explore uh, where we would uh, place a well. Uh, we're going to follow an actual well, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to follow an actual field, uh, although I have used modern data and modern techniques. Uh, the field was discovered in 1965, and uh, uh, the data quality and the tools that we have uh, are far uh, inferior to what we have currently. Uh, we start prior to the first offshore licensing round in the area. Uh, I'll show you the area in a minute. Uh, it's from Australia, and we'll work our way towards a management review uh, for a uh, wildcat well location that uh, the exploration team wants to drill. So here's the uh, syllabus. Uh, there are eight topics, uh, introduction to zero down through management review. Uh, it's been broken up into six webinars and they will be every uh, Tuesday and Thursday for this week and the two uh, uh, next weeks. So we, uh, we're scheduled with this uh, agenda to finish on February 8th. So uh, this course, uh, I, I have developed it. A lot of the materials that I use, I originally uh, uh, used for training purposes at ExxonMobil. Uh, we are grateful that ExxonMobil and uh, AAPG have released the materials so that we could put it uh, out uh, through these webinars and on the website. The target audience is upper-class geoscience majors uh, and graduate students. Uh, if there is copyrighted material, I have that notated, and uh, if anyone wants to use the materials, they need to uh, follow proper procedure. And uh, as was on the uh, title slide, this is for educational purposes only. Uh, it's not intended for other people to make money off of it. So how do you get to the resources uh, other than uh, uh, dialing into the live webinar? Uh, in the um, uh, browser, you can uh, type in www.iris.edu, and that will bring up uh, the IRIS uh, uh, main page, you want to click on education, and then click on lessons demonstrations, and then uh, scroll down to where it has resource type. If lesson is toggled on, toggle that off, and then course, which is grayed out because lesson is toggled on, will become active. You click on course. And then uh, there are two courses currently on the IRIS web pages. The first is one that I gave uh, uh, earlier. Uh, well, <laughs> we have sh shifted years. In uh, 2017, uh, that consists of uh, 34 lessons uh, with uh, recorded webinars and lecture material and exercise material. Uh, the one that we're doing now is Petroleum uh, Exploration, a Field Example. Uh, there are eight lessons, I think uh, lecture zero through four with the associated exercises are uh, already available. Uh, the other uh, four will be added uh, soon. And the, um, the videos will be placed on the uh, lesson tabs uh, uh, within 24 hours. So right now, uh, 
Uh, all the uh, lessons down to Source Rocks Lesson 4 are online, and so you can access the uh, material. And uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, everything will be uh, available, including the uh, webinars. So the field that we're going to look at is uh, off of Australia. So here's an index map, the continent of Australia. The little island here is uh, Tasmania. The water in between Tasmania and the main continent of Australia is the Bass Straits. And there's a basin, a sedimentary basin within the Bass Straits that's called the Gippsland Basin. And so the field that we're going to be looking at is the Barracuda field, uh, which is the red uh, elongated uh, feature right there. Uh, red for me is uh, gas uh, as opposed to oil. And so this is a uh, very significant uh, gas field. It was the first hydrocarbon discovered offshore Australia. As we go through the scenario of early exploration, of course, that's a secret. So uh, don't tell anybody, uh, but there's a big gas field out there that we'll be looking at. If you are working on an IBA team, uh, uh, Imperial Barrel Award, uh, a couple of things about that. Uh, I'll guide you through some of the typical steps that we do in an analysis in the early exploration. It's by no way a complete analysis. Each of the uh, IBA data sets is different in terms of the type of data, the quality of the data. Uh, they're also different in terms of uh, what you might be working towards, what your, your technical goal would be. So uh, some data sets have uh, a lot of wells and hardly any seismic. Other data sets have uh, either one well or no wells and a lot of seismic. And so you can't uh, cookie cutter my presentation to fit your data set. And creativity is one of the things that the IBA judges look for. So um, uh, again, don't, uh, don't try to force what I'm doing uh, to match your particular uh, study project. So uh, let me pause for a couple minutes here, uh, see if there are any questions at this point. And um, after uh, maybe a couple of questions, we'll move on to lecture one about the exploration task. So if you have a question, if you would type it in the chat area, on the uh, go to meeting, uh, uh, go to go to webinar panel, uh, uh, Danielle will read that and uh, speak uh, so I can hear it. Sure. So thank you, Fred. Yeah, that was a great um, example of like how you would write in a question. We don't have any questions so far about your introductory section. Um, maybe we'll just wait one more minute and see if anybody has a chance to write anything in. But if not, then we'll have you proceed with lecture one. Okay. And uh, do feel free to type in uh, questions in the chat area as I am talking. Uh, we'll hold the questions till the end, but uh, so that we can uh, use our time effectively if you uh, put your questions in. Uh, sometimes if you have on slide, uh, 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 in your question, uh, you know, on slide 23, why was uh, the arrow pointing to the left instead of the right? Uh, then I can go back to that slide when we get to the questions. Yep. So uh, lecture one is on the exploration task. Uh, another way uh, to phrase that is to say that we're going to talk about play elements. So uh, in geoscience, in industry, oil and gas, energy, um, we can subdivide the workflow into four stages. So we have uh, time here uh, early in the business cycle uh, to late in the business cycle. The four main stages is first we have to capture areas of high potential so that we uh, have the right to explore and drill and if we find hydrocarbons we can produce them. Uh, the second stage is after we capture the area, we have to discover hydrocarbon reserves, oil and gas. The third major stage is to initiate production. And then the fourth stage is to deplete the fields. So exploration is uh, uh, charged with finding new areas, capturing those mainly through lease sales, working up uh, the blocks that uh, we have the right to explore in, and coming up with uh, one or more places 
where we want to drill an exploration well to try to discover hydrocarbons. If we look just at exploration, we can further subdivide that, um, again, early to late in the uh, exploration cycle. We have to identify high potential regions, then we have to locate quality leads, and a lead is something that uh, we see in our data set that looks like it could be a uh, hydrocarbon field. We have to capture exploration licenses. Then we're going to mature a lead to a prospect. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but a lead is something that catches our interest, but it's not something that we're ready to propose to a vice president that we want to drill. After we've matured the lead, we've done more technical detail, we've addressed a series of questions, we might be ready to propose drilling that lead. And at the point where we have done enough homework that we're confident that we want to propose this to management, that's when we start talking about it being a prospect. We'll drill uh, wells into those prospects to try to find the hydrocarbons. And then exploration usually uh, finishes up its task when it has confirmed that the discovery will be economic. There'll be enough hydrocarbon there for the company to make money. So they may, in a, a prospect, drill a, a discovery well, a wildcat that's successful, and they might drill um, one or two or five or eight more wells to verify that it is an economic uh, accumulation of hydrocarbon. So uh, I mentioned this, what is a lead? It's something that geoscientists find that might be a trap that holds an economic volume of oil or gas. Uh, as a lead, it's worth further study, but we're not ready to propose a drilling target to management yet. We haven't done enough technical work. A prospect is something that has been scientifically matured to the state that we are ready to present it to management uh, and ask them to, uh, to drill it um, because we think there's a good chance to have a, uh, uh, enough hydrocarbon that we will make some money. We have to estimate what we will recover, oil or gas, uh, how many barrels of oil, how many cubic feet of gas, and then what's the chance of success that the well is actually going to be successful. So that uh, chance of success might be uh, 60%, it might be 80%, it might be 30%, uh, but that is something that uh, we have to tell management. So to capture areas, uh, uh, there are, I think, uh, 700 plus sedimentary basins on the planet. We have to figure out which of these 700 offer the highest potential to still have undiscovered hydrocarbons. Once we have a short list of, uh, of uh, basins that uh, have high potential, uh, which of those can we hope to operate in within the next uh, several years to maybe 10 years? Is the landholder, if it's uh, offshore, it would be a government. If it's onshore, it might be uh, Farmer Jones. Um, will, it, is it likely that uh, we'll be able to get exploration licenses for those particular areas. And then what can we do to get ready to enter this area uh, if we think there's going to be a licensing round off of a, a country uh, in an unexplored basin, uh, what can we do now so that once a uh, lease sale is announced, uh, we've uh, done some of our preliminary work and we can get a head start on our analysis. So stage one, the workflow, typically what we'll do is regional studies. Uh, and so uh, in this case, the example is looking at uh, offshore West Africa. Maybe we find an area that we think has high potential for undiscovered hydrocarbons. Perhaps the, the government offers up eight blocks. Uh, and so we have uh, a period of time, typically six months to work up the data to figure out uh, if we want to bid on any or all of the blocks or maybe none of the blocks. Uh, I'll be talking about play elements. Uh, this is a play element adequacy map. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it says reservoir adequacy. Uh, and the colors here are like a traffic uh, a light. So uh, red means stop and uh, green means go and yellow means caution. So 
if we looked at reservoir uh, in the uh, eight block area, it looks like block seven and eight, a little bit of four and a tiny bit of three uh, look favorable, and part of block five looks favorable. We'll come up with interesting leads. So we have lead A, lead B, lead C, features that we've identified that have uh, possibilities in terms of holding economic uh, hydrocarbon. And then we have to uh, do some profit analysis, how much might be there, how much uh, money would it cost to uh, develop a field, how much will we get from selling the oil or gas. And then if it looks like we could make a profit, uh, we might recommend uh, in the earliest part of exploration that our company should bid on block seven and eight and not bid on block uh, one through six. So I mentioned play elements. Uh, a play is a combination of the conditions that make a hydrocarbon field possible. Uh, a play element is one of the necessary conditions. Different companies use slightly different terminology but the play elements that I am most uh, comfortable with is talking about source or source rock, reservoir or reservoir rock, a trapping geometry, a ceiling lithology, and hydrocarbon migration. So in order for a uh, uh, new area to have an uh, economic field, we need all five of these uh, elements. And so, uh, People talk about uh, looking at play elements and then the adequacy of uh, the individual elements and then the sum total of all of them. Uh, we're in uh, uh, football playoff uh, approaching the Super Bowl. Uh, if our favorite team has a quarterback that completes uh, 18 out of 20 passes, uh, 90%, uh, that would be phenomenal. Uh, with play elements, 90% uh, isn't good enough. We need all five of them to work uh, in concert together. Because if we have an area where we have source, reservoir, trap, migration, but no seal, nothing will be trapped uh, for us to, uh, to be able to um, uh, get hydrocarbons and uh, make some money. If we have reservoir, trap, seal, migration, but we have no source rock, uh, then there's no nothing that's been generated, and nothing for us to discover. So what do we need for success? We need these five play elements. Um, Rube Goldberg was an illustrationist who lived back in the early 1900s. He used to make a very complicated uh, apparatus that did a simple task. And so if Rube were alive, I'd say, Rube, what do you need? And he would say, Fred, the first thing you need is a kitchen a place where organic material gets cooked. And then in the subsurface, you need a container, some place where oil and gas can be taken out of the ground through pipes. Uh, another way to say that, we can produce the, uh, the fluids. And since the kitchen and the container are usually separated uh, laterally and uh, vertically, um, uh, oftentimes uh, geologic, uh, different, different age geological formations, we also need plumbing so that when we cook some hydrocarbon in the kitchen, uh, it can percolate and get over to the container. So uh, this is actually an anti-Rube Goldbergian display because it's taking something that's very complicated and oversimplifying it. Being a bit more technical, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, some of the animation. Uh, we need to put the well in the right location so we hit the container and then we get oil out of the ground and money into the bank. And so uh, I should also point out that this is for conventional fields, not for unconventional or resource plays. Being a bit more technical, we need source material, a source rock. We need hydrocarbon migration pathways. And for the container, we need a reservoir quality rock. Uh, it has to have a trapping geometry and the reservoir has to be capped by a seal so the hydrocarbons are still held in place. Another way to look at play elements is to uh, consider that we need four essential elements. We need source rocks, we need reservoir rocks, we need sealing rocks, and we need overburden uh, material that uh, will push the rocks down deep enough uh, that we can uh, generate oil and gas. 
And we also need two major processes. We need trap formation. Uh, so it might be a structural trap. We may need some sort of uh, structuring uh, to create a, a huge anticline. And then we need hydrocarbon processes, hydrocarbon generation, hydrocarbon migration, and hydrocarbon accumulation. So for the kitchen, uh, the source rocks, we need organic rich rocks. Usually uh, the best source rocks are in shales and the best uh, shales are deposited under low oxygen condition and oxic environments so that the uh, oxygen doesn't oxygenate all the organic material. Uh, we also need the right temperature and pressure conditions such that the geochemical processes to transform the organic matter into molecules of oil and gas has occurred. For the container, we need reservoir quality rock, uh, rock that is both porous and permeable so that we can get the fluids out. The most common reservoirs, conventional, uh, would be uh, sandstones or some type of coarse plastic. Uh, and then several types of carbonates can have reservoir quality, porosity, and permeability. We need a trap, a three-dimensional configuration in the subsurface where significant amounts of oil and gas can be collected or pooled or reservoired. There are traps that are purely structural. There are traps that are purely stratigraphic. And there are a number of uh, traps that have a structural component and a stratigraphic component. For the CO, we need rocks that prevent the leakage of the hydrocarbon out of the trap. Uh, what uh, we look for are units that have very low permeability. Uh, that would be the connectedness of the pores uh, within the rock. Uh, the most common seals are shales. And the more extensive the shale, the better likelihood that it's going to be good uh, seal. So marine shales tend to be better seals than uh, uh, fluvial or non-marine shales. And then any type of evaporite, uh, because all the uh, salt-related uh, lithologies have very low permeability. We need the seal at the top of the trap, and we also need it to go down the sides of the trap so that we can have a thick enough column of oil or gas that it would be economic. And then the plumbing, we need hydrocarbon migration. Uh, again, talking about conventional fields, we have to get the, the uh, oil and gas generated in the source, usually in fine grained rocks, to the porous and permeable reservoirs. The primary mechanism for migration is buoyancy. Uh, gas is uh, less dense than oil. Oil is less dense than brine or water, and so, uh, uh, there's a force that uh, drives gas and oil uh, higher into uh, uh, structural positions. Some of the migration may occur parallel to the stratal uh, units within our, uh, our basin, uh, making use of sand or silt layers. Uh, migration pathways do not have to have reservoir quality, porosity, and permeability because we have uh, millions of years for the hydrocarbon to percolate through the strata. And then some migration might occur across the stratal boundaries, uh, making use of fault zones and fracture networks. There's uh, three other components uh, that are important. Uh, they're secondary in nature. So we have the five big ones, source reservoir trap seal migration. The other thing we worry about in exploration is timing. Did the trap form before the hydrocarbons began to migrate? Uh, so we need the container in place before we start uh, generating oil and gas. Uh, second uh, of the three uh, secondary components is fill and spill. Has hydrocarbon generation been so voluminous that the volume that we generate is greater than the volume that the trap can hold? That does happen quite often. And then we have to worry about spillage out of a deeper trap, possibly uh, spilling to a shallower trap. And since oil is more valuable than gas, we're always interested in uh, uh, cases where we have uh, fill and spill, where ultimately is the oil gonna be located? 
And then the uh, third of the secondary components is preservation. There's two things that can happen that uh, are bad for hydrocarbons in a reservoir. Oil can be degraded uh, if it gets too hot and we start to thermally crack the oil. Uh, the longer chain hydrocarbons get broken down into shorter and shorter chains. Uh, we can take oil and thermally crack it all the way down to uh, methane or gas. If the reservoir is too cool, then we have to worry about bacteria getting in and uh, chewing on the long chained uh, hydrocarbons, uh, oil molecules, uh, leaving what uh, we might call biodegraded oil or some people might call it tar. So uh, let me illustrate this hydrocarbon fill and spill concept. Here's my source rock. Uh, Rube has uh, generously loaned me his cauldron and we're cooking it. We're generating uh, oil molecules. Uh, the yellow band is our migration pathway and also our reservoir rocks. We have an anticline for trap A. If we can fill trap A down to the point of the dotted line, uh, we have what is called a synclinal spill point. It's the uh, uh, shall, uh, shallowest point in this uh, low. If we add more hydrocarbon and uh, trap A is filled to this position, the excess hydrocarbon will be able to uh, spill up, up dip, uh, up the migration route to trap B. If trap B is uh, defined by a fault and this fault can leak hydrocarbons, we can fill trap B down until the top of the reservoir hits the fault. If we add more hydrocarbons, the hydrocarbons would move up the, the uh, fault plane. So if this is a thermally uh, cool basin, uh, we are, uh, have cooked the source rock enough to generate mostly oil and just a little bit of gas. Uh, my convention is green is oil and gas is red. So I'm generating some uh, green uh, oil molecules and I'm started to fill up trap A. Uh, I say minor gas, but I don't show any red because if there's only a minor amount of gas, uh, it can be dissolved within the oil. And so I have oil with a little bit of dissolved gas. If this basin happens to be a little hotter or maybe a little older, Maybe my source is generating oil, but it's also starting to generate significant amount of gas. There might be so much gas that the oil can't dissolve all of it. And so I'll have a free gas cap and then an oil leg and this oil will have some dissolved uh, gas within it. If the volume of oil and gas exceeds the capacity of uh, trap A, then we'll start to spill hydrocarbons through the synclinal spill point and we'll start to feed trap B. And since gas is least dense and it likes to be highest, the gas is prefer preferentially gonna be trapped, the oil is gonna be spilled. So what will spill to trap B is oil with perhaps a little bit of dissolved gas. And we can start to infill trap B. If this basin is even hotter than we thought, we could get to the point where we've already generated all the oil that we can. Now we're generating a large quantity of gas. We've generated so much gas that it's flushed all the oil out of trap A. Oil and gas are spilling out of A up into B. We have a gas cap at B. We have an oil leg at B. Uh, the oil might have some dissolved gas. And if the combination of the volume of trap A and B is not sufficient to hold all the generated oil and gas. We would have spillage up the fault and that uh, spilled hydrocarbon would be oil with a little bit of dissolved gas. And if I'm a good exploration explorationist, and I think this is what has happened, my next question is, is there a trap C further up in the migration pathway where I might be collecting some spilled oil. So we can use these play elements. If we can make a series of maps, a maps of where the source rocks exist and where they've generated mostly oil or uh, oil and gas, and maybe present day only are generating gas. 
if we can determine where reservoir quality rocks were deposited, if we can locate potential traps, uh, structural traps, stratigraphic combination traps, if we can deduce the hydrocarbon migration paths, and if there's been any spillage from one trap to another, then we can decide which basins we might want to focus out of the uh, 700 uh, for a particular basin, which blocks that are up for lease uh, hold the greatest promise. And if we have blocks uh, in such a situation, where should we position our wells so that we have the best chance to evaluate uh, uh, finding new oil and gas, or maybe planning how to develop a new discovery, or perhaps uh, uh, further along in the um, uh, work process, uh, how can we uh, most effectively de deplete the field? So what we'll do is we'll make a series of maps. Uh, typically, people make on the order of eight or nine or 10 related to these uh, play elements. And so we have five play elements, uh, something like source. We might have a source quality and a source maturity. Uh, reservoir, we might have reservoir quality and a reservoir presence. And so we can have uh, a number of maps. And then we'll look for locations where all of the play elements are favorable. And so for the example with these eight offshore blocks, uh, I have a source maturity map. I have a reservoir environment of deposition map. I have a map showing the structural traps. I have a map showing uh, potential hydrocarbon migration pathways. I might have uh, three or four or five additional maps I'll try to integrate all of those and come up with what's called a play adequacy trap, a uh, play adequacy map, again, using a traffic light color scheme. So green is the favorable areas. Red would be an area where one or more of the play elements is not favorable. And yellow is the uh, gray uh, area uh, where uh, we may have the right conditions, but we might not. So uh, as we go through the uh, eight lessons, and there are accompanying, accompanying exercises that you can work, the exercises and their solutions are on the uh, IRIS web pages. Uh, we're going to look at the Gippsland Basin uh, for our uh, scenario, our play acting. Uh, the government of Australia has offered up 15 offshore blocks. Uh, your company has assigned a team of five people, five geoscientists, you're one of them, to evaluate the 15 blocks. The team will compile data from onshore wells and from outcrops, and they'll try to deduce the regional geological story, and I'll talk about that uh, on Thursday. You'll uh, generate a series of play element maps and then try to identify uh, interesting leads. And then for each of those leads, uh, the team would want to make uh, estimates, uh, first order rough uh, estimates of how much hydrocarbon there might be and what sort of risk or chance of success uh, there would be. And then based on uh, those interesting leads that seem to be economic, uh, you would come up with a bid, bidding strategy. Our, our company should uh, bid on block seven and eight uh, our bid for uh, block seven should be higher than it should be for block eight. So if you do the exercises, uh, uh, this is the base map for our offshore blocks. So we have block 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, the northern tier, uh, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, the central tier, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, the southern tier, and the black and red lines uh, are the seismic lines that we have to do uh, a um, semi-regional analysis. And again, I'll get more into this uh, on thir Thursday. So that's uh, all I have uh, prepared for today. Uh, if you go back to my other course on petroleum geoscience that has the 34 units, if you want more information, uh, I suggest you look at lesson one and lesson two out of those uh, 34. So uh, with that, I will turn the microphone back over to Danielle and see if there are some questions.
Great. Thank you so much, Fred. The first question uh, came in quite a bit ago, but the question was just, what is the difference between a seal and a trap? Uh, a trap is the three-dimensional geometry that we need. So that could be an anticline, or it could be a uh, stratigraphic pinch out of resolute quality sand against the basement. Uh, the seal is the lithology that we're going to call upon to actually hold the hydrocarbon in place. So in order to have a container, you need all three. You need a reservoir quality rock, rock that's capped by a seal, and the uh, reservoir and seal has to have a trapping geometry. Great. Um, Autumn asks, um, can lithology be identified in 2D seismic lines? Lithology can be inferred from uh, seismic, either 2D or 3D. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, you really should go to the petroleum uh, geoscience uh, uh, course. Uh, there's a couple of uh, lessons on that. What we try to do with the seismic is to try to figure out uh, how uh, the environments of deposition uh, varied over our area. Uh, so, uh, uh, as we're going to see with Gippsland, we have a fluvial environment to the northwest, and we go into a uh, uh, transitional marginal marine towards the center, and we get offshore as we go to the, uh, uh, the southeast. And given the environment of deposition, we can then look at some seismic attributes like seismic amplitude. And we can see if there is some sort of a uh, suggestion uh, as to uh, maybe we're in a fluvial environment, uh, if we see uh, amplitudes that have a meandering uh, a map uh, presentation, then we might say that's uh, where we have uh, uh, major river channels and we might have a good likelihood to have some, uh, some uh, fluvial sands. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. So that's all of the questions that we received. Um, so with that, this concludes the introduction and lect uh, lecture one. Um, and please join us on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, time where we will cover lessons two and three. So great. Thank you so much, Fred. Okay. Thank you all for uh, attending and thank you, uh, Dr. Sumi, for uh, hosting us so graciously. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>